Hello and welcome to Books of Blood. My name is John and today uh, once again I have got another uh, installment in the Horror Across America series. So today we're going to be talking about two states and that is going to be Oklahoma and Oregon. I know a couple of commenters, well I think maybe one commenter, has been waiting on me to do a list of books for Oregon so that's going to happen today. So that being said, let's go ahead and get underway with Oklahoma. So the first one I chose for Oklahoma is actually a non-fiction book. In fact, you may not even be able to call it a horror novel, but from the things I've read about it, it's still pretty frightening in its own right, and that is Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and The Birth of the FBI, and this is by David Gran. In the 1920s, the richest people per capita in the world were members of the Osage Nation in Oklahoma. After oil was discovered beneath their land, the Osage rode in chauffeured automobiles, built mansions, and sent their children to study in Europe. Then one by one, the Osage began to be killed off. The family of an Osage woman, Molly Burkhart, became a prime target. One of her relatives was shot, another was poisoned, and it was just the beginning as more and more Osage were dying under mysterious circumstances. And many of those who dared to investigate the killings were themselves murdered. As the death toll rose, the newly created FBI took up the case and the young director, J. Edgar Hoover, turn, turned to a former Texas Ranger named Tom White to try to unravel the mystery. White put together an undercover team, including a Native American agent who infiltrated the region and together with the Osage began to ex expose one of the most chilling conspiracies in American history, and that is Killers of the Flower Moon, and that is by David Gran. All right. Okay, now we're going to move on to the fiction. That was the only nonfiction I believe I have on this list, so, you know, I just got it out of the way, all right? Alright, next up we have got The Outsider, and this is by Stephen King. Uh, one thing I'm going to say about The Outsider myself, before I read the synopsis, The Outsider is responsible for me getting back into reading, alright? Before, uh, I think I started back reading in 2019, and I read 173 books. I'm not bragging about that, it's just what I did. I just kept going and going and going. Uh, and then 2020 COVID hit and everything, and that kind of slowed me down. I didn't read as many, about 120. And then here in, and then 2021, I just, boom, took off like a rocket, all right? Uh, I'm not reading as much this year. I know that. Uh, I, things in my life have happened. Things have made, you know, um, uh, I've had to kind of put the brakes on a few things. And then just, like I said, because of circumstances in my life, um, things have kind of changed, all right? And my outlook on reading is a little bit different. Uh, I'm not trying to read every book I can get my hands on. I'm taking my time with the books I do read. But, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. That being said, The Outsider is what got me back into reading. Because I had not been reading at all before that, okay? So, that being said, here's the synopsis. An 11-year-old boy's violated corpse is discovered in a town park. Eyewitnesses and fingerprints point unmistakably to one of Flint City's most popular citizens, Terry Maitland, little league coach, English teacher, husband, and father of two girls. Detective Ralph Anderson, whose gun Maitland once coached, whose son, I'm sorry, whose son Maitland once coached, who coaches a gun? I don't know. Uh, whose son Maitland once coached orders a quick and very public arrest. Maitland has an alibi, but Anderson and the district attorney soon have DNA evidence to go with the fingerprints and witnesses. Their case seems ironclad. As the investigation expands and horrifying details begin to emerge, King's story kicks into high gear, generating strong tension and almost unbearable suspense. Terry Maitland seems like a nice guy, but is he wearing another face? When the answer comes, it will shock you as only Stephen King can. And that is The Outsider, and that is by Stephen King. Okay. All right, next up for Oklahoma, we have got The Last Harvest, and this is by Kim Liggett. I plead the blood. 
Those were the last words 17-year-old golden boy quarterback Clay Tate heard rattling from his dad's throat when he discovered him dying on the barn floor of the Neely Cattle Ranch, clutching a crucifix to his chest. Now on the first anniversary of the Midland, Oklahoma slaughter, the whole town's looking at Clay like he might be next to go over the edge. Clay wants to forget the past, but the sons and daughters of the Preservation Society, a group of prominent farmers his dad accused of devil worship, won't leave him alone, including Allie, his longtime crush, who suddenly wants to reignite the romance after a year of silence, and hated rival Tyler Neely, who's behaving like their old friends. Even as Clay tries to reassure himself, Creepy glances turn to sinister stares, and strange coincidences build to gruesome rituals. But when, he, but when he can never prove that any of it happened, Clay worries he might be following his dad down the path to insanity, or that something far more terrifying lies in wait around the corner. And that is The Last Harvest, and that is by Kim Liggett. And that is going to do it for Oklahoma. So we're moving now into Oregon, okay? And the first one we're going to talk about with Oregon is The Loop. And this is by Jeremy Robert Johnson. And this is a, has a very brief synopsis, okay? All right. Turner Falls is a small tourist town nestled in the hills of, of central Oregon. When a terrifying outbreak rapidly develops, this idyllic town becomes the epicenter of an epidemic of violence. All right, so I'm going to leave the uh, the picture for the uh, cover up a little bit longer. I want to ask you guys: uh, when you read a synopsis, or when you go to look at a synopsis for a book, do you like longer synopsis, or, or a longer synopsis, or you like one that's just kind of shortened to the point? I I'm kind of in the middle because I I want to know as much as I can about the book, but at the same time I don't want to be I don't want the synopsis to spoil anything for me uh, in the book or in the, in the story or whatever. So let me know in the comments down below what you guys think of that. All right, long synopsis, short synopsis. All right, so now we got next up we have the end of the sentence and this is by Maria Davana Headley and Kat Howard it begins with a letter from a prisoner as he attempts to rebuild his life in rural Oregon after a tragic accident Malcolm Mays finds himself corresponding with Dusha and I'm going to try not to butcher this name Chuchaniov a mysterious entity who claims to be the owner of Malcolm's, Malcolm's house, jailed unjustly for 117 years. The prisoner demands that Malcolm perform a gory, bewildering task for him. As the clock ticks toward Douche's release, Malcolm must attempt to find out whether he's assisting a murderer or an innocent. The end of the sentence combines Kalapoya, Welsh, Scottish, and North mythology with a dark imagined history of the hidden corners of the American West. Maria Devana Headley and Cat Howard have forged a fairy tale of ghost and guilt. Literary horror blended with the visuals of Jean Cocteau, failed execution, shape-shifting goblins, ma goblins, and magical blacksmithery. In Chuchoniov, they've created a new kind of beast, longing centuries later for beauty. And that is the end of the sentence, and that is by Maria Davana Headley and Kat Howard. Okay. And next we have The Devil Crept In, and this is by Anya Alborn. Young Jude Brighton has been missing for three days, and while the search for him is in full swing in the small town of Deer Valley, Oregon, the locals are starting to lose hope. They're well aware that the first 48 hours are critical, and after that, the odds usually point to a worst-case scenario. And despite Stevie Clark's youth, he knows that too. He's seen the cop. Sh he knows that too. He's seen the cop shows. He knows what each ticking moment may mean for mean for Jude, his cousin and best friend. That and there was that boy, Max Larson, the one from years ago, found dead after also disappearing under mysterious circumstances. 
And then there were the animals, pets gone missing out of yards. For years, the residents of Deer Valley have murmured about these unsolved crimes and that a killer may still be lurking around their quiet town. Now fear is reborn, and for Stevie, who is determined to find out what really happened to Jude, the awful truth may be too horrifying to imagine. And that is The Devil Crept In, and that is by Anya Alborn. Okay. Alright, next we have Red Moon, and this is by Benjamin Percy. They live among us. They are our neighbors, our mothers, our lovers. They change. When government agents kick down Claire Forrester's front door and murder her parents, Claire realizes just how different she is. Patrick Gamble was nothing special until the day he got on a plane and hours later stepped off it, the only passenger left alive, a hero. Chase Williams is sworn to protect the people of the United States from menace in their midst, but he is becoming the very thing he has promised to destroy. So far, the threat has been controlled by laws and violence and drugs, but the night of the Red Moon is coming when an unrecognizable world will emerge and the battle for humanity will begin. And that is Red Moon, and that is by Benjamin Percy. Okay. Alrighty here. Okay, next up we have got Meddling Kids by Edgar Cantero. All right. In 1977, four teenagers and a dog, Andy the tomboy, Nate the nerd, Carrie the bookworm, Peter the jock, and Tim the wymeraner, solve the mystery of Sleepy Lake, the trail of an amphibian monster terrorizing the quiet town of Blyton Hills leads the gang to spend a night in Du Bois Mansion and apprehend a familiar culprit culprit, a bitter old man in a mask. Now in 1990, the 20-something former teen detectives are lost souls. Plagued by night terrors and Peter's tragic death, the three survivors have been running from their demons. When the man they apprehended all those years ago makes parole, Andy tracks him down to confirm what, they, what she's always known. They got the wrong guy. Now she'll need to get the gang back together and return to Blighton Hills to find out what really happened in 1977. And this time she's sure they're not looking for another man in a mask. A mad scientist concoction of H.P. Lovecraft, teen detectives, and a love of Americana, Edgar Cantero's Meddling Kids is a story filled with rich horror, thrilling twist, outright hilarity, and surprising poignancy. And that is Meddling Kids. And that is by Edgar Cantero. All right, and I believe this is, yes, last but not least, we have got Grind Your Bones to Dust. And it's by Nicholas Day. In his first novel, This is Horror and Wonderland Award-nominated author Nicholas Day invites you to take a journey into a hell that is at once uncomfortably familiar, yet unlike anything you've ever encountered before. A surveyor finds himself pursued by flesh-eating donkeys in the furthest regions of Oregon's desert. A mass murderer leaves the sanctity of his mountain home to pursue a long-lost love. His guide, an otherworldly raven possessed by a 19th-century American humorist, in nearby Klamath Falls, two estranged childhood friends set off to find a missing father with the help of two aging cowboys, and a prisoner in her own home sees a vision of death and knows there is no escape. Pain is proselytizing. Death is the one true faith and everyone worships in their due time. The gates of Nile are wide, wide open and waiting to grind your bones to dust, and that is Grind Your Bones to Dust, and that is by Nicholas Day. All right, and that is going to do it for Oklahoma and um, Oregon. Until next time, thank you guys for watching, and take care, and stay scared. Bye-bye.